Welcome to the BioBalance HealthCast, episode number 353. Hysterectomy, three questions you should ask. BioBalance HealthCast features conversations about positive aging. Your hosts are Dr. Kathy Maupin, medical director of BioBalance Health and a leading expert in treating symptoms of aging, and Brett Newcomb, a licensed professional counselor. Dr. Maupin and Brett are the authors of The Secret Female Hormone, the seminal work about hormone replacement therapy for women, which is available on Amazon or from Dr. Maupin's office at BioBalance Health. Dr. Maupin's office is currently accepting new patients. Last, the last time we did a podcast, we were talking about hysterectomies. And we discovered that there are several different types of hysterectomies that can be done. There are a lot of different reasons why hysterectomies are now done and some of the history of what they, the way that it used to be done. Uh, and we learned that there, if a woman is told by her physician, we recommend that you have a hysterectomy and or we recommend that you have your ovaries taken out uh, and, and one can come first before the other then there's a discussion that needs to be had between the woman and her physician. And there are three questions that need to be discussed. So today we're going to continue that conversation and talk about uh, a, a type of hysterectomy that, that we did not cover in the last uh, podcast. This type of hysterectomy is called a super hysterectomy. Supra cervical. Supra cervical hysterectomy. Yeah, super is it my term. Uh, <laughs> Super cervical. We're going to talk about what that is and why it is controversial uh, or has historically been controversial mm -hmm. among uh, OBGYNs and, and who are going to perform the surgery. And it's less controversial now, but there are still questions that need to be asked and answered to do what is right for the woman based on her lifestyle, her needs, and her medical necessity. So there's some options that are involved. And then after we talk about that type of hysterectomy, we're going to talk about the three questions that women and their doctors uh, should process and evaluate before they actually have the surgery. So what is so, a super cervical, supra cervical hysterectomy? A super cervical hysterectomy, first the definition again of a hysterectomy is taking the uterus out. And the uterus is the uterus and the cervix. So everybody thinks taking the uterus out means taking both. That's one connected piece. You it is one it connected out. piece and you can take it all out. Okay. But then the, the it used to be that we always did super cervical mm -hmm. because it had less contamination. The vagina is never completely clean. So to take the uterus and the cervix out, you have to open the vagina and then you close it. You stitch it closed because the vagina is attached around the cervix. So, so that would, that contaminated the wound before, uh, we had a lot of good antibiotics and, and we had more sterile technique. Now we have great sterile technique, antibiotics if we have any kind of infection. So when, when I was trained in the 70s and 80s, we did total hysterectomies taking the cervix out. And that was the standard procedure. So if you needed just your uterus out, you had a total hysterectomy. Because of the risk of contamination, meaning the risk of the woman getting some horrible infection. From the vagina. Result of the surgery. Well, we weren't worried about that when I was trained. Right. But before that, we worried about it. But by the time I was trained, we had we had great prevention for that. So we took the uterus and the cervix out, and then stitched the vagina closed. Right. So basically, we were taking anything out that could, uh, in terms of the uterus, that could get cancer, that could get uh, could cause bleeding. And those are two things that most women love that they're not going to get cancer of the uterus and they're not, or the cervix and that they're not going to bleed anymore. So that's, that happens if you take the cervix with the uterus. Okay. But then in the recent past, um, starting in about 2000, we discovered that we started studying sex and anatomy and physiology of sex um, a little bit Gyne more. Gynecologists didn't know about all that. Well, they didn't really acknowledge it. Sex was something, you know, we have one day on. Yeah. You would think we would have lots of lectures and lots of information about sex. And, you know, in my day, everybody kind of turned red and didn't talk about it. Well, but you did the science part of it. You did the fertility piece. <clears throat> you did the pregnancy pieces. You did the delivery piece. It was all about getting pregnant, but it pieces. wasn't about having sex. Having sex. 
<laughs> and in infertility, we took sex out of it. We just yeah. basically started doing in vitro. Yeah. So, I mean, because sex wasn't good enough. And I mean, in many cases, it doesn't work that way. But wasn't good enough to get you pregnant. Right. I mean, but then we started looking at the quality of sex. And I think it, it, it started with basically women complaining mm -hmm. about the fact that after their hysterectomy, they didn't have their, the orgasms they had before, they didn't have any more. Therefore, we started looking, at least I personally started looking at why that was. And was it somebody who was just, it had scarred her emotionally and she wasn't having orgasms or was it physical? And we found that it was physical, that when you take the uterus out and the cervix, you're taking, you're disconnecting nerves that go to the cervix that provide one of the multiple types of orgasms. So the cervical orgasm then no longer occurs. Is available because you don't have the cervix. You don't have you the cervix. Have the cervical orgasm. So uh, that was one of the reasons right. that I started contemplating for my patients and my own hysterectomy, leaving my cervix in and leaving their cervix in. So I then looked at the other benefits of leaving the cervix in. First of all, your operative time is, is shorter, which is, I, you know, you want the shortest operative time at, for, any kind of for any kind of surgery. Right. So that was one of the benefits. Then I looked at um, the support of the pelvis of all the ligaments that go to support your pelvis and are attached to the cervix. So if you take the cervix out, you lose a lot of support. So a lot of times when women would get quite old, their their vagina had nothing at the top of it. It would pull out and it would it actually prolapse. prolapse and come down into the, the vagina would invert on itself. And it would almost be like a hernia. Bowel would be inside the vagina and it would actually show if you had somebody in lithotomy and you're looking, meaning their legs up, you would see this bag. It was the inverted vagina. It was just suspended just inside, coming coming out like a hernia. Yeah, that had to be fixed, and it's not that easy to fix. And surgeries aren't always successful to fix that. So in my mind, I'm always thinking, well, how can I avoid that? Can, can you go in and tighten the the walls? To you can. You have to take out part of the walls and make it smaller because it it distends it and makes the vagina right, really right. big. Right, stretches out. So, um, so in that case. There are many procedures you can do, and I would suggest that you go to a specialist in vaginal repair. Like we have one specialist uh, at St. John's and one, I mean, at Mercy, and we have one at Barnes and one at St. Louis U. So, but there's not a lot of them, but they are specialists in reconstructing the vagina, and right. it takes that to have a lasting repair. Right. So that's why just by a few years and it'll happen again. It, yes, it can. Okay lift something or do some kind of cert or uh, exercise, lift weights, it can happen again. So I didn't want that personally, but I also, before I had to have my hysterectomy, I had already talked this over with my patients and said, you know, we have, you, do, you can't do this if you have cervical cancer or you've had cervical cancer. So you have to, you have to take the cervix out if you've had those problems. Right. Those are, that's absolutely necessary. But Nowadays, we found that we can tell if somebody has abnormal cells and we usually treat it ahead of time. We don't see cervical cancer because of the pap smear. Right. So because it's less common and those problems are usually handled before this hysterectomy was ever contemplated, we then have the choice to keep our cervix. And so the biggest problem that people would come up with is... Well, then you're going to bleed afterwards because there's a little lining in the cervix that can be affected by hormones that can cause you to bleed. Okay. So, so you still have a quasi period or a full period? Or, no, not a full period, but you can have but spotting. You have bleeding, spotting, spotting at some time in the month. Right. And so, I, so my answer to that is that's easy. You just core the lining of the cervix out. That doesn't affect the support. It doesn't affect sex. You just pour that center part out, take it out, and no more bleeding. So that's what I did on all my surgeries. Why don't most doctors know that? Because they're because the American College of OBGYN doesn't really consider sex to be important. 
So they don't. I will. I mean, t- I mean, I'll make that blanket statement. Yeah, yeah. They don't think about sex. They don't think about your sex life when they're telling doctors what kind of surgery to do. Because they're scientists. That's right. And scientists can't possibly be thinking about sex. I mean, really, we all think about sex. So, so this is something we should contemplate. We should try to retain the uh, orgasms of our patient. What if that's the only kind of orgasm that patient's ever had? Well, then she's left without orgasms if right. we take her cervix out. Right. So I, I looked up all the different types of procedures and added this one little thing where you just, it takes a, two minutes to remove the endocervical canal. Right. And then you stitch the cervix up like you would have stitched the vagina up and, and close it so that there's no communication between the abdomen and, and the vagina. You don't want that. So, so basically, we would take the uterus out above the cervix, and it, it works great. Patients didn't even know, their husbands didn't know they had a hysterectomy because from their end of it, from the vaginal end, there's still a cervix there. It feels the right. same. It looks the same. It acts the same. Uh-huh. <laughs> you know. And the women were still having the orgasms just as they did before. And many better orgasms because <laughs> they had pain before. They had a huge uterus or their uterus was retroverted and they were bumping into, sex would cause the, the, the penis to bump into the top of the uterus, which hurt. Or, you know, so we sure. fix the problem. Now they can have great sex. Why would we remove that? Yeah. <laughs> and, and nowadays it's even more, it's even a stronger, or it should be a stronger concern because now we don't even get pap smears, but every three years after we're over so was 40. was that an accidental discovery because they were trying to figure out how to prevent a prolapse <laughs> or? Uh, you I mean, mean to take the cervix out? To, to leave it in. Well, we used to leave them in. People rarely had prolapse of the of the cervix because they had the support right. after that. But it, it can happen. Uh, but then they just decided it was once we had antibiotics, we'd just take the whole thing, take out. The whole thing out. And everybody was afraid of cervical cancer even more than they are now. Right. Because we didn't have the procedures we have now to use a colposcope and look at it and biopsy it and 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 take out a part of the cervix and not all of it. Now yeah. now we can do those things. So you have to look at history in retrospect sure. in a way that you have to say, we did this because of this, but now we're past that. We don't need to be concerned about cervical cancer as much as we used to in the United States. So now we can leave the cervix in. And when I, I you know, I had my very good friend, Laura Ballman, do my hysterectomy, and she felt comf- more comfortable having one of the cancer surgeons in in case I had a lot of adhesions, uh-huh. plus she's my friend. So... She and I discussed it and decided to leave my cervix in. I had to take my ovaries was that out. Was considered experimental or new uh, approach? It was, Uncommon? It was, I, I'd been doing it for 10 years before that. Okay. But, um, but she and I discussed it. It wasn't how she was trained, you know, but she had been doing it like I was yeah. on certain patients so that she selected to do that procedure. But right. we, when, when my very good friend uh, Kevin Easley came in, I said, you know, I'll get you if you take my cervix. <laughs> I know where to find you. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, because I had no reason to have it removed. So, right. so the procedure went, the procedure itself went very well. And thus I have everything that I need. I don't need my ovaries anymore and they were causing trouble and I don't need my uterus. So from personal experience, this is, this is what I consider to be the, the best, best possible outcome, possible once outcome. It was determined that you needed the hysterectomy in the first place. Right. And I would al- always offer it to my patients sure. who did not have a history of cervical cancer or had not had surgeries for cervical cancer because that would mean they might get it again. So, Okay. So that's the supra... Cervical. Cervical. Leave my cervix in hysterectomy. <laughs> yeah, leave, leave it alone. Don't, t- don't mess with it. Right. Other and, than to core it out. Mm-hmm. Uh, so... What are the three questions then that that a woman who is told, okay, we need to do either or both of these procedures for your survival? Essentially? So the first question is, should I keep my ovaries? Okay. Or can I keep my ovaries? And the now, primary reason for keeping them if is you're going to lose the uterus anyway. Right. If you want, if you are young and you're having a hysterectomy for fibroids or bleeding or after a his, after a C-section. You want to keep your ovaries because you're young and you want to keep the hormones that the ovaries provide. Okay. And there, and we discussed last time, basically the things that would keep you from, from being able to keep your ovaries. Mm -hmm. So that's, but that's very important after menopause. 
it used to be if you were menopausal, we took ovaries out. That's what we were told by the American College of OBGYN. Right. Now they've opened up a little more room to say, discuss it with your patient. Right. And unless there's one, two, or three, which we also discussed, you know, different things uh, present, then you can leave the ovaries in. And so we discuss it with our patients. And many people are very personality-wise, they just want it all over with. Mm -hmm. Take it all out. Don't want it. Right. And then there are some patients that say, I want to keep as much as I can keep. And I want to keep my hormones. And I don't want to be on hormones until I would naturally be in menopause. Right. So those people, those Have people keep their ovaries. Right. And, but they're at risk for another surgery if their ovaries do something bad. Right. Now, the second question is, can I, can I keep my cervix? Is that, you know, medically wise? Is my history um, applicable to that? And then the last question is, how are we doing this hysterectomy? And that's, that basically, there are four kinds of hysterectomies. There's um, the old-fashioned abdominal type, and we no longer, unless you're, there's cancer, go up and down. We make a little incision, uh, just like a C-section incision, above the pubic bone and go through there. And you just clamp it apart. And you just stretch skin and right. use a, use a uh, retractor that holds it open enough that you can see to do the surgery. Right. So that so basically, it's not the disfigurement it used so to be. So you don't puff them up with gas because no. you couldn't. No, we just it's just like an open surgery, which is a major procedure. Right. I mean, this is a hysterectomy is not just oh, like a DNC. You go in, you go to sleep for a few minutes, we clean out the uter the, the uterus, and then you wake up. And this this has the a hysterectomy of any type has the risk of blood loss, which would possibly cause you to get a blood transfusion. It also has the risk of infection, mm -hmm. which would mean you'd have to be treated with antibiotics and stay in the hospital. You can get bowel obstruction because after any abdominal surgery, your bowels don't work right. for a while. Right. And so they can get obstructed. You can develop adhesions. In any of these procedures, you can develop adhesions. Some are more likely to produce adhesions than others. But the abdominal surgery has all of these. I mean, the abdominal incision has all of these risks, and it takes between one and three hours at the most, so under anesthesia. But that's still something you have to consider. So when you're looking at the four types of hysterectomy, the abdominal hysterectomy, vaginal, meaning everything comes out through the vagina, laparoscopic, which can be through little tiny holes uh, that we put probes through and, and work with these chopstick kind of instruments, mm -hmm and uh, tilt your head down and put gas in your abdomen, or da Vinci, which does the same thing, only da Vinci is much more um, delicate. So if you're, somebody's worried about adhesions, they've had, they make adhesions, they want the adhesions removed, um, then the doctor can the, do the that. Da Vinci is more tiny and more precise. Right, but, but it can take it. up to five hours right. under anesthesia. So you be under anesthesia So the, the drawback is five hours under anesthesia. Right. In the best of hands, three hour, three hours, because right. anything that's that delicate it takes longer. Yeah. But you still have the the risks of hysterectomy, just like everybody else. Right. So, so those are the four types, and then you have to ask, and you have to ask, what what incision are we having? What's the operative time? We discussed that. Can I keep my cervix with this procedure? If my uterus is bigger than twelve weeks, can I still do this procedure? Twelve weeks is like that big, like kind of like a cantaloupe. Meaning if you're pregnant? At the no, time? we, we measure everything by pregnancy. Okay. So a 12 week uterus is, no, not, we don't do hysterectomies while pregnant. Well, I didn't think so. so that's why. I... No, I, I'm sorry. That, that does sound awful. So, um, a 12 week size uterus is the same size as a uterus would be okay. if you were 12 weeks pregnant, which means it comes up to your pubic bone and pushes everything else up, your intestines right. and everything right. else up. So it's, you know, this big, but you can't remove larger than that through some of these procedures. Right. It, it's, it's not so, done. So that's one factor in determining it right. is and how large is the uterus at the time of the surgery. Right. Uh, what about cosmetically? If a woman's concerned, what do I look like in a bikini or what do I look, you know, scar if you want no If you want no incisions, right. then a vaginal hysterectomy is the best procedure for you. But. The drawbacks to a vaginal hysterectomy is we have to take your cervix out. We can't leave oh, that in. Okay. And so, you won't have orgasm anymore. Well, you won't have that type of orgasm. You may have clitoral orgasm or 
or um, vulvar orgasm or anal orgasms, but you're not going to have that kind of orgasm. Okay. So you have to kind of determine Should what actually. Know you have to going. figure out which ones yeah, what, that you your... have, that which is introspective yeah. or trial and error. Yeah. But um, but that's something that as a woman you have to figure out yourself. Your doctor is not going to tell you that. You have to also, though, I mean, I don't know. So, so a, a vaginal hysterectomy doesn't take that long. You're not in the hospital longer than a day, and the recovery is better, but you still can't lift for six weeks. No matter, usually you can't lift for six weeks just because we don't want to push down on where we have either taken the uterus out and left the cervix. Yeah. We don't want to rip through that. Right. So you have to stay. You can't lift weights. You can't do abdominal exercises for six weeks, but you can do arms and legs. And, sure. So that kind of thing. But the vaginal hysterectomy is the fastest recovery. It, it really is the simplest. And I used to do that all the time, but here's why I don't like it. And here's why I stopped doing it. We can do a, his, we can do a hysterectomy through tiny little scars mm -hmm. that, you, that are going to heal and you won't see them. Right. Uh, which is just as cosmetically pleasing. And we can leave the cervix. But the vaginal hysterectomy literally pulls down on all the ligaments to get the uterus through the vagina, Pull it out. you're in lithotomy position, not lying down flat. You have your legs up in stirrups, just, just like you would if you were in a gynecologist's office. And the gynecologist has to grab, grab onto the cervix and pull it all the way down through wow. the vagina and clamp, 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 and cut all those ligaments that were holding the uterus up. Right. That sometimes is very traumatic to the pelvis. I don't mean emotionally. I mean physically traumatic. Right. Where you're really, it feels almost like you're ripping. Ripping or tearing. Sure. So you're you're loosening the whole support of your pelvis at that point, and then we have to kind of fix it, and it takes several different procedures to do that as we close. But I, if you don't lift anything, and if you're really good and don't you know don't exercise for the six weeks, then you can heal. It's just that, it's just that to me as a woman, I mean. It just seemed traumatic. Sure. So I tried not to do that, and right. I wanted to leave the cervix. So I would choose to do one of the others. Yes. And you would recommend that for most patients? For most people, just yeah. because of, I mean, they don't know how it's done. But you put together a chart, mm -hmm. uh, sort of a decision-making matrix that right. tells you what the pluses and minuses for all these things are. And mm -hmm. we will post that with the material that we mm -hmm. post with the podcast. So that's, and that's something, but the I think the other things that I brought in to think about mm -hmm. our days in the hospital yeah. because abdominal hysterectomy is usually two to three. Vaginal hysterectomy can be less than one. Laparoscopic is less than one day in the hospital. Da Vinci, usually they keep you a day or two for just to observe you. Not always. So, but we also look at blood loss. Vaginal hysterectomy, if the uterus is less than 12 weeks, which it should be, is basically very low in blood loss. And then, and so are the laparoscopic and the um, and the uh, Da Vinci. But always wanting to get around blood loss right. for my patients that had to have an abdominal hysterectomy, I would make a small incision, and that decreases blood loss. And I would also give my patients vitamin K, a um, hundred micrograms, two to three tablets a day for a week before surgery and a week after. And that dropped my blood loss to almost nothing. Reduces bleeding. It reduces bleeding right. because most women are low on vitamin K. It's in green, dark green leafy vegetables, and we don't get enough of that. Right. And so that was something that I added, which I got the award at Mercy for the lowest blood loss one year because of that. That's the only thing I changed. Sure. So that so you always the surgeon's always trying to adapt to the, da the drawbacks of a procedure. And so right. I was adapting to the drawback right. of an abdominal well, hysterectomy. Just because normal people don't think about doctors getting awards for that sort of thing, but that's actually a pretty, <laughs> I know, it's, pretty special thing. Yeah, it's it was. a significant issue. It was, and it was, had to do, I also, it was, at the same time, they gave me a award for shortest hospital stay after, sir, after hysterectomy. Sure. Because patients could go home in a day. The other thing I did was, <laughs> I brought all my patients a can of, Campbell's chicken noodle soup the day after surgery, even if they hadn't passed gas, because the stuff you get in the hospital is terrible, and they should just switch to that. And I brought them a cup and a spoon, and I had their spouse or whoever was with them take the cup, 
heat it up in the microwave down yeah. the hall on the floor it and have them drink it yeah. and 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 it had noodles in it so all of a sudden they'd pass gas and they could go home yeah i mean it was it was one of those adaptations i wanted to get patients out of the hospital cuz you only get sicker if you're there a long time yeah. yeah so so this so basically you have to look through these and then the limiting factor is what does your doctor want to do so if you go to your doctor and you say, I want a Da Vinci, well, I never did Da Vinci, but Dr. Ballman does, and she's really good at it. So I would have said in my practice, if you want a Da Vinci, and if that fits everything, then I'm sending you to my partner and Dr. Ballman will do your surgery right. because she's great at it and I don't do it or I haven't done it she's very got much. She's little tiny hands. That fit <laughs> That's right. No. She's, yeah, yeah, she's, <laughs> but she's, I mean, she's younger. She learned procedures that you didn't learn that I didn't learn. Because medicine keeps evolving, keeps changing. It does. So and the important part is that you, as a consumer, need to have information, be aware, be participatory in your healthcare decisions. And you have to make sure your doctor just does, doesn't just placate you and treat you like a child and say, "I'll do what I want to do," because you're left with that body. And after the surgery, they're done. Yeah. So you need to make sure that your wishes are known, but give your doctor enough room to do the right procedure, like. If I take one ovary out, leave the other, if it looks okay, that kind of thing. Right. You have to give them room for operative decisions. So everybody has to be flexible and to make the right decision. And if you do this, you'll be happy and you won't be without orgasms or sexuality. Or And we can always replace your hormones if you have to have your ovaries removed. Now that we do testosterone and estradiol in pellets, it's just like you had an ovary. I feel as good as... My ovaries made me feel. Did you remember feeling before? Yes. Again, as always, thank you so much for listening. Email your questions or comments to podcast at biobalancehealth.com. You can find the Biobalance HealthCast on iTunes and on YouTube. For more information about bioidentical hormone pellet therapy and other reverse aging solutions, visit biobalancehealth.com or call 314-993-0963. You can find Dr. Maupin on Twitter at Dr. Kathy Maupin and on Facebook at facebook.com slash biobalancehealth. Find Brett Newcomb at brettnewcomb.com.